tell you a little bit about my background and then how Scott and I met, and then Scott's going to tell you more about the project and, and his background. Um, so I'm from Winsboro, South Carolina, which is a really, really small town in South Carolina. Good morning. And I went to school in Charleston and then moved up here to Charlotte and was actually a pediatric ICU nurse for 18 years, which was such a, a great joy of mine. And um, loved working with children. And you know, in the ICU you see really, really horrible things that are happening in your community, so that was tough. But in 2003, I had a really rare illness called Guillain-Barre syndrome, and I was completely paralyzed from my chest down. Mm -hmm. And 15% um, of people never walk again, so I didn't know what my stats were gonna be, but luckily, I'm so fortunate to be walking and talking and eating again. Um, shortly after that, I heard a sermon in our church. We go to Covenant Presbyterian, not far from here. And it was about a homeless woman who sells all her artwork and gives back to the community. And that sermon just ripped my heart apart. And I looked at my husband and I said, I'm gonna do something. He's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I had all these friends at the time just painting emerging artists in their midlife 40s crisis. And I said, I wanna have a fundraiser. Strictly be a volunteer. So we started having something called the Carolina Art Story, and it went on for four years, and we ended up raising close to a million dollars over those four years for the Urban Ministries 945 program, mm -hmm. um, and the Beyond Brave Foundation. So the very last year we had it, we had it at NASCAR Plaza, mm -hmm. and the folks that ran NASCAR Plaza also was Parkway, and they also ran Earth Tower. Um, about a month after that event, these people called me up and said, hey, we enjoyed meeting you, we enjoyed the energy. We'd love for you to come uptown and see the space right next to the foundation and consider opening an art gallery. And I said, sure. <laughs> and my husband, who's a pediatrician, he has a great love for children too, and he said, what? You know, we don't have any background of business. And I said, you know, I think an opportunity happens like that, you just have to take a chance. So I opened the gallery about five years ago, and right when I opened the gallery, I was finishing a yoga teacher training with Scott's wife, mm -hmm. Jonna. So I don't know if any of you ever practiced with his wife, Jonna Smith. She's amazing. Everybody knows yeah. Jonna. She, she has taught all over, but right now she's at YT Yoga, and she does workshops all over the country all over the world, actually. She's doing it in Morocco, same if anyone wants to get So, um, I'm not for that. Yeah. <laughs> so right about the same time I opened the gallery, my father, who was my idol, was, he had Alzheimer's and was going downhill really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And I had all this conversation driving back and forth in Columbia, South Carolina, to here, saying, what have I done? This is the dumbest decision ever. I've got three kids or even chick away three nights a week. <laughs> yeah, this is just not a smart decision. But the day I parked at Curse Tower and was having that conversation, I walked down the stairs, and the woman who I heard um, in a sermon about who gives back her artwork was sitting down here looking at my gallery. Oh, and wow. so I hadn't seen her in about a year. And um, good morning. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't seen her in about a year, and I, I went and spoke to her, and you may have seen her on the street. She has one leg mm -hmm. and a dog. Her name is Tatiana. And um, I said, Tatiana, I haven't seen you in about a year. Do you remember me? I'm Hannah. I sold some of your artwork. She's like, oh, yes, this is Hannah. I never come over here. I decided to come and sit and look at this beautiful gallery. And I said, that's my art gallery. And she's like, what? <laughs> and um, so that reignited our friendship, and um, being uptown is really amazing and awesome. I think what she has taught me versus what I have given her is, is just immeasurable. So that started, I guess, my real love and interest in how I can be a part of our homeless community, our poverty community, and how I can make a difference. Jonna 
Scott's wife introduced us, and she said, I want you to meet my, husband, my boyfriend at the time. Um, he's an amazing photographer and cinematographer. And I said, yeah, let's meet. So Scott and I met out here in May of 2015, <laughs> um, almost three and a half years ago, and, and just had a, a great connection and friendship, and he was showing me some of his work, which he'll tell you about later, and I was blown away, and I said, let's do something with this, and he said, yeah, let's do something. I'm in between gigs, and, you know, let's use our gifts, let's do something with me. So, originally, it was only supposed to be about two or three months of giving back, and now we're three years into mm -hmm. this, and even more passionate and excited. And we have a full team of people that have been helping us with it, and it's been really interesting the things that we've learned along the way. Um, we've been supported by Charlie Alberson, who's been one of our biggest cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. We just recently got um, endorsed by Bye Lyles. We had a meeting with her. And we also met with Stephanie Cooper Luter, and she about jumped out of her seat when she heard about this project. And she said, I want to be a part of your team. And we were like, okay. <laughs> said, well, maybe not right now. But she <laughs> has completely endorsed this project as well, as well as Center City Partners. They're very excited about it, especially with Charlotte's 250th birthday celebration coming up. They have lots of thoughts going on in their heads. Um, so we're really excited to tell y'all about it because we want to see this happen and we're so fortunate to have someone like Scott with his ability and, and his talent to be in Charlotte and that he grew up here. So we want to see this happen and we believe it will. We just, it just needs to reach the right people to partner with us and believe, believe in it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Um, I had sort of a plan for a small group, so if we need to shift it, just let me know. If you don't want to know something, I think what we're planning on doing is telling you a little bit about me, how I got involved, like what Hannah just did, where I'm coming from, sort of what we believe as an organization, um, and then leading into what we're trying to do, the project we're trying to get off the ground right now, which is serving children in our community. Um, so I'm just going to sort of follow that plan, and if at any point you're bored or if you want to know something <laughs> different or if you have a question, let's have this be a conversation and kind of everybody just jump in. Um, so I am from here, sort of. Moved here in 86 uh, when I was 13. My family, I was born in upstate New York. Um, my dad worked at Davidson. My mom was a, a middle school teacher and then an assistant principal and a principal at Piedmont Middle School. Um, so this is sort of where I grew up and then launched off into the world um, and become a, a photographer and a cinematographer um, and recently came back to Charlotte about five years ago, I think. My mom was getting older and tiring and needing a hand, and, um, so I'm back. Um, so I am a cinematographer, a photographer, and I thought I'd start off by showing you sort of what I do. I shoot documentary television series for Red Bull and National Geographic, and there's actually a show on ABC right now um, that, I, that I worked on. Um, so I just wanted to show you a quick trailer for one of those shows, so you, as you can sort of get a sense of, of my background and, and where I'm, what I do or what I have done. So this is a show that we shot for Red Bull um, in Switzerland for a couple of months. It's on Netflix now, so if it, is interesting to you, you can go watch it on Netflix. Um, it's about a helicopter rescue company. It's a, kind of a famous, um, world-known helicopter company that is at the base of the Matterhorn in the town called Zermatt, which is like the European aspect. Um, and so basically, if something bad happens to you when you're out on the mountains, these guys come and get you and take you to the hospital. Every morning when I wake up, and through the window I can see the Matterhorn. It's a beautiful day. And there's a mark. It's like a big family for all of us. We do around 
1,700 rescues a year. You have to stay focused. You never know how close you are to the limit. Every mistake you do could be your last. Pilot crashed on the north side of the Swiss Alps. My son, he asked me, Daddy, why are you still flying? I said to him, when you decide to be a rescue pilot, that's what your passion is about. You decide to help people. So that's like the type of thing I do. And like where you saw the, the guy getting pulled up on the winch yeah. out of the side of the helicopter. So here's the story. So when we went, we had to have all this training with safety training because this is obviously rather dangerous. And one of the things they told us that we were not allowed to do was go down on the winch. And so I think the second or third day there, I'm like out on a flight following them. And the CEO of the company is one of the pilots, like one of the old school master pilots and so we're going we're flying out there and it's 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 basically they need to use the winch if it's a really steep mountain because the helicopter can't land and so they drop you down from 150 feet up to get in there and so this was going to be a winch rescue and so this is like day two or three and the sea of the pilot is like all right scott you're going down <laughs> and so i'm like what <laughs> and so just sitting there and the, the paramedic hands me this belt you know it's like a climbing harness and you put it on and, and i'm with the camera and you just step back off the thing oh, and you, wow. get, oh my God. you get lowered down 150 feet to this dude on the side of the mountain and so it's crazy. So there's that sort of stuff. Job. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is the. I want to show you this one too. This is a Nat Geo show I did with this journalist, this guy named Michael Ware, who was, who was this crazy dude from Australia, who was CNN's Baghdad bureau chief for years and years and years and years. Um, and he would always get himself in really precarious situations and have a little camcorder that he took with him. Um, he was almost beheaded like seven times. Um, and he made a documentary of that footage called Only the Dead See the End of War, which is an HBO thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then Nat Geo hired him to do a series where he went around each episode investigating, sort of an investigative news story all over the world. And I was hired to, sh to shoot it. Um, this particular piece I'm going to show you is from an episode we did in Papua New Guinea um, about witch burning, um, because witch burning is alive and well and actually growing in Papua New Guinea. I think it's over 200 women a year um, are burned for being witches, mm -hmm. tortured and burned, and it's a whole. An assumption of being witches? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's proof, they have proof, because okay. witches, like, they put, like, a piece of bamboo on a table and they recite all these names okay. and when, the bamboo does something, it means that you're the witch. But you can also buy your way out of it if you, because pigs are like the currency there. Mm -hmm. Like they have, the women breastfeed pigs because they're so important. Yeah. And so if you have a pig, you can, like basically if somebody dies, because they don't have science, and so if somebody dies it, of unnatural causes, it's witchcraft. And so, and their way, of, that's their understanding of the world. And so, you have to then kill the witch because she's killing people in the community. And so we went out and investigated this. And so this is just a clip from in the jungle. Finally, the Hayward leader agrees to talk. Yes, we not do something more. We could stand, we passed out, we face less, we had none. Is it? He's speaking on behalf of everyone. He says, yeah. yeah, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, I'm a Christian, I'm a father, but this belief is part of my life. Yeah. And I can't just yeah. take it out. Yeah. It's, it's part of me. Yeah. How can I extract yeah. it? No, we must have to do it. No, 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 no,
themselves and say, we have something more. But it does have to do with, yeah, they admit to having it. Huh. It escapes me why they would do that, but so people do confess. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll say, it wasn't me, it was the one from over there or the yeah. one from over there. Yeah. But they'll tell us, and we have no idea, so we just believe it. Is it good Sanguma and bad Sanguma? Sanguma is good, but you mean one that has a good thinking. No, no, Sanguma and it is. The other one is dangerous. Yeah. Oh, Manda Gavinis, this is Manda, one of our accused. Oh, hello, Monica. Mm -hmm. Her mother was murdered. She's accused, her son is accused. So, so they're all within the same family. So he believes that she has this Sangoma spirit inside her. I mean, believe it was her mother and that. So he said, how would we know if she has Sangoma? Mm. It's a spirit. You can't see a spirit. Right. right. We've been told by right. people who would know, because they're also Sangoma. Manda has it. So right. we believe it. Yes, we did not mean I can't even I was going to kill her, but then she said she didn't have it. It right. wasn't her. Right. But then the others turned around and said, no, it was her. Right. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so I asked him, in your own life, your wife was accused of being a son of a and murdered. Now, do you think... She was murdered. His wife was yep. murdered. So do you I'm think sorry. that she was correctly accused? I'll probably be facing one of me. And two women besides that of family will be. There's no way that my wife is a son of a woman. I don't accept that. Right. Her family, my family, and I, myself, and I believe she was not a woman. And it was completely falsified oh. accusation. Right. Don't so... But when there's a bad Sangoma, do, does, do people believe it is okay to then kill them? It's, you, get, you have to kill them? It's okay to kill them? Is it the right thing to do? We must kill him then. We must kill him then. This man, this priest, whose own wife was falsely accused, still believes that witches must be punished. In so many ways, this tells me how deep and intractable the belief in Sangoma is here. Yeah, so point being of both of these is to show you like that this has been my life, this is what I do, which by all, I mean you said it, you love your job, I mean my life has been crazy, like hanging out in helicopters in the Swiss Alps, taking, we flew on a plane and landed on a grass field in the mountains of Papua New Guinea to get there, you know? We did an episode in Swaziland where we interviewed the king, one of the last true absolute monarchs on the planet, and like went to this big huge festival celebrating him and went and interviewed a king, you know? Like I'm literally traveling around, you know, interviewing kings. And about three and a half years ago when I met Hannah, it wasn't enough. Like there was something was missing from my life. Like it was just like it's almost like the veil got thin where it was like, what am I doing? Like I'm having super great fun. I work with all my buddies. I travel around the world. I see cool stuff. I make beautiful things. I make good money. But something is missing. Um, my wife and I don't have children, and so the energy doesn't go there. But it's like there was something missing. There's something got to be something more to my life than what was missing. Um, and around, around that period of time, like I'm a person who reads lots of books and I, I, I study a lot of different spiritual traditions, science um, across the board and, and everything I was reading was one of those moments where everything in my life lined up mm -hmm. and everything I was reading telling me service, like service, 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 you need to serve, that is the key to everything um, in life. And around that period of time, I, I got asked to be part of the refugee photo project in Myanmar for the Rohingya refugees, because um, I had spent a, a good bit of time in there uh, documenting the Buddhist monks um, in Myanmar. And so I had this opportunity to go to Myanmar. Um, and at that point, I just randomly met Hannah. My wife was like, you need to show your photographs to Hannah. And I have this friend Hannah who has a gallery. So I go and see Hannah. And Hannah looks at the photographs, and then she starts talking about her work with Tatiana, um, and talking about the homeless situation in Charlotte. Um, and that's like, huh, that's interesting. Um, and then the very next day, I go over to Piedmont, my mom's middle school. I don't know how much you guys know about Piedmont, um, but it's 50% free lunch, and yet they have the number four science Olympiad team in the country. And it's just this really dynamic 
fascinating, integrated, sort of successful place. And I had started over the years working with some of the students there um, and donating money to the school through the social worker. Not a huge amount of money, it was a lot for me, but to pro provide like um, birthdays and Christmases and field trips and if a family had a tragedy to help buy groceries and things like that. And so I, would, I was, had gone to Piedmont the day after I met Hannah to drop off some, some old computer equipment to donate to the school. And, and Marie, the social worker, um, grabs me and pulls me into her office and she's like, I need to tell you, like she wanted to update me, give me the update on these are the kids and these are their stories that have been helped by this, this, um, this money that I had donated. And I was like, Marie, I'm busy, I don't have time, I gotta go. And she's like, Scott Gardner, you need to sit down. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, and I'm like, okay. So she pulls out this folder. Um, and she starts walking me through, you know, what had been done with the money. And it came to light that that, that year at Piedmont, they had 13 homeless students. Um, this is a middle school. And she starts telling me this story about this one girl in particular. As part of Piedmont's curriculum is they have a, uh, a mandatory service component, like you have to do a community service project. Um, and so there was this girl who was living in, her, uh, in a car with her brother and her mother and her father. And so Marie calls this girl in um, to her office and says, you know, we're gonna waive the requirement for you. You don't have to do a community service project. And the girl was like, well, like, what are you what, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, you're, we know your family's having a hard time building your car, um, and so we're gonna it's gonna be difficult for you to do. And she's like, car works, and my family's gonna drive me to the shelter where I'm gonna do my community service. This is a 13 year old girl, and it's like, and it just hit me like it's on the bricks. And I'm like, Marie, like, I want to do something about this situation. And she's like, you are. You know, like birthdays and Christmas is, and field trips is really important. Like you can't, can't underestimate how important it is for a kid to get a bike or whatever. And I was like, I know, but I don't want these kids to be homeless anymore. Like, and it, that was the, the dawn of this for me was the realization that at this time where I'm you know, planning on going to Myanmar to take pictures of refugees halfway across the globe, it was like, looking in a mirror for me. It's like, why am I doing that? Am I doing that out of a desire for service or or am I doing it out of a desire to have the appearance of service? Like a Sean Penn going to Haiti moment with a scarf and, you know, like looking <laughs> cool, you know, and helping, you know, helping people that, like, when there's people in my backyard, and that was my real realization that there is a massive there's massive work to be done here in Charlotte every day, rather than special occasion, good Instagram moment, like cool trip to Myanmar. Um, and so I called up Hannah and said, "Let's do something." And so this is this is this is where we are. And so we started about Face Charlotte. Um, and so how do I serve? How did we serve? How did we get started? Um, around this time, we also watched. Uh, Dale Mullinax, Mullinax I think that's it, um, did a TED talk, a local TED talk about offering your gifts in service. Like the idea isn't like for someone like me that I need to go get retrained to be a social worker or start an orphanage or do anything like that. It's like take what you are good at and offer that in service. And he told some really amazing stories in that TED talk about like there was a muralist who wanted to paint a mural and so they did a mural at Urban Ministry Center and all these, you know, their clients, their neighbors were participating. And one of these guys is like a pretty gnarly, aggressive, mean guy. He's out there painting, and Dale strikes up a conversation with him. And it turns out he used to paint with his grandmother, but they're estranged because he was an addict and, like, you know, stole from her and left. And, like, and Dale's like, let's call her up. And he's like, no, she doesn't want to hear from me. And he's like, no, we're going to my office. We're going to call her right now. Tracked her down, called this guy's grandmother in Detroit who was, of course, overjoyed to like mm -hmm. hear that he's alive. He went mm -hmm. back home to Detroit, got himself together. And all this came out of a painter painting a mural at Urban Ministry Center. Um, so the idea is, is what am I good at? I'm good at taking pictures. I'm good at like documentary, helping people tell their stories. Um, so that's sort of just where we started. It's like we started partnering um, with various nonprofits around town to tell the stories of the people that they serve. Because it's our belief, it's one of my deeply held beliefs, 
is, is that storytelling creates connection. It's, it's, it's a magical thing. Um, it's like, and I'll talk a little bit here about sort of the, the underpinning philosophy about what's going on w with this. Um, we're all, everybody I know is struggling in some level. The most successful people I know, the wealthiest people I know, everybody's got something going on. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world increasingly where we're bombarded with messages that isolate us and divide us, both politically and in terms of, you know, consumerism and like, like the messages to, to buy and to have and this divisiveness. And like we're all caught up in it. And I think most of us are innately good and we innately care about people and care about their, their, their suffering, but we get so isolated. Um, and there's, there's a real magic that happens when you get beyond that, when you get outside of yourself and sit down and meet another human being and talk to another human being who's different from you in, in a vulnerable way, where there's vulnerability in both ways. And you hear someone else's story and you hear where they're coming from, but they're going through stuff too. And it's healing, there's like a healing quality that happens when two people get together and talk about themselves and their stories and listening um, and so that's what we try to do, is we try and, and, and meet people that, that you wouldn't normally meet, you know, and put human faces on some of these issues. Like, we did a lot with homelessness when we first started out. It's very easy to, to have opinions about homeless people if you've never spoken to a homeless person. Um, and you sit down and you start talking to people and this magical, this magical thing starts to happen when you get to meet somebody and you realize that you're the same, that we're all the same. I am you is one of our core beliefs and values and, and charity and philanthropy and all that stuff. It doesn't work if it's like I am the benefactor who is bestowing the <laughs> blessings upon you. It's toxic, it's, it just doesn't work and it's wrong. And so what we try to encourage is, is that connection where you, you get together and you realize that we are the same. There, but for the grace of God, I would be I would be in the situation you're in. I can't tell you how many homeless people we've been to where it's like, if I grew up in the life circumstances that you grew up in, I would be on the streets, drug addicted, prostituting. I'd be exactly the same. There's nothing that special about me. I was just born into a certain set of circumstances um, <coughs> that, that led me to where I am today. So that's sort of where we started is we, just started talking to people, meeting people, hearing their stories, various folks, um, putting their stories out there through Charlotte Agenda, um, and just saying like, hey, let's all connect to people. And around this point in time, we, we started working on a story um, at a child's place, because that's really where my heart is, is with children. Um, and so we wanted to tell these children's stories. And so we were, went over there and started hanging out with the kids at Walter G. Byers, um, which is where they do a lot of their work, uh, meeting these kids, playing with them, photographing them. Um, and it, at that time, I got, a, I got a, a, a call for a job for Discovery Channel, a big job, um, that was going to be all over Southeast Asia for like three months, like all over Indonesia, Tasmania, New Zealand, Kerala, India, like, dream, you know, like literally like the grand world tour, making a bunch of money, hanging out with my friends. And we were at that time working with the child's place. And these children, you know, these kids here, these two brothers, and can't show their faces because kids get home homeless kids get bullied for being homeless. And so we ended up telling the story through their mother, Sharika. Um, and we're telling the story and Sharika came up hard, you know, and got into trouble, and went to prison, and had, you know, multiple kids, and like, but she was trying to make it work, you know, like, she was out there, she had a job, and, you know, just hear, talk, hear her talking about her children and the struggles she was going through, and the victories that, that were happening, I was just sitting there, I remember sitting there working on this story, and I'm talking to this producer from LA, and it's like, man, like, I don't know if I could look myself in the mirror if I, if I choose to, to stop doing this work, to go off and have this sort of grand adventure life. And so I turned the job down. Can I tell the story? Sure, yeah. He won't tell it, but I'll tell it. 
So um, <laughs> this was our first shoot, and the child's face was great working with them. And Scott was really kind. He won't tell you this, but he donated um, professional images of the children to give their mothers for another child. Mm -hmm. So they had a real portrait of themselves. Mm -hmm. But um, I knew that he was getting that phone call to take this really big job. Scott was taking pictures. We were reading to the kids, having conversations with them, and this little girl came up to Scott, pre-pubescent, had little buds and <laughs> big braids, and she said, can I, can I hold your picture and take some pictures of, or can I hold your camera and take some pictures of my friends? And I looked at Scott and he said, sure. And so he handed his camera over to this little girl, and she runs off on the playground, and she's like hanging off on the monkey bars, <laughs> taking all the pictures of her friends. And I said, Is it really <laughs> And he said, Yeah, it's a bad habit. <laughs> 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 you know, she was just taking all these pictures of her friends, and then when we were leaving that day, she looked at him and she said, Mr. Scott, can I give you a hug? And, you know, you're trying to be appropriate and all that. And he looked at me and I was like, yeah, she, you know, she gave him the biggest fair hug. Mm -hmm. Because, he, you know, he gave her that trust and love and friendship and honor. And she hugged him and I looked at him and I knew. I was like, that's it. He's here. Mm -hmm. And then she said, Mr. Scott, you stinky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so we, we kept going, um, and we would tell all these stories. This you may know Moses. This was sort of the big the big story. Um, Moses is a homeless guy. He was a street preacher. And he uh, preaches out on the corner of Amity. Um, so we did his story, and we put it out. Went out to Charlotte Agenda, and it got a lot of views, we got a lot of publicity, and so we had a lot of people coming up to us afterwards once people had seen one of these stories, and they were saying, I was moved, I was crying, I was sitting on my floor crying, I watched the whole thing, I watched all the stories, but what do I do? What can I do? What can I do? As you can see how we were doing it here is we just provide links to people who are serving these folks, but it wasn't enough. We weren't getting people to really engage and take action. Um, and so we sort of decided we needed to evolve the project. We needed, how do we get people to engage? How do we get people to reach out and be a part of things? And so we did this, um, we started this project last year called the Blessing Box Campaign, um, which as this slowly loads, um, basically the idea is, is how, do we, how do we get people, provide a fun, engaging way for people to practice kindness and compassion? How do we get them to engage? with other people and look for opportunities to do good works. Um, so that's not just once a year we go to the soup kitchen on Christmas Eve, but how do we make it a habit? How do we make kindness a habit? How do we make compassion a habit and encourage connection between people? Um, so one of our team members came up with this amazing idea called the Blessing Box Campaign. Um, so how it worked, um, basically you get one of these boxes, people could sign up to get one of these custom made boxes that had 100 strips of colored paper in it. Um, and as well as the paper, there was a giving guide, like an idea for things, kind things you can do for other people. Um, and the idea is you take one of these boxes, you put it in your home, you put it in your Sunday school class, you put it in your place of business, um, and collectively, as a unit, your family, whatever, your goal is to do 100 acts of conscious kindness and compassion over the course of a month. Um, we started off, we, we did, made 1,500 of them. We did a, a, a GoFundMe type thing, raised the money, did 1,500 of them. Those got taken in like a week or two, so we had to order 1,000 more, then ended up being 2,500 of them total. Um, we were, CMS got on board, we were in over 50 schools, we were in faith communities. All, all faiths were represented. We were at the downtown police department, we were in the government center. Um, it sort of went, far and wide, basically. And so across the city, everybody was doing these, these acts of kindness and compassion, some of which you can see down here. Some of the things that people did, these are actual um, strips of paper. 
My husband did an electrical job at a home with several elderly people and children, one an infant. He noticed that they didn't have any heat, so he fixed that too. The baby was sleeping on the floor on blankets, so we brought them a folder crib of sheets and baby items. Reached out to a mama in need, struggling with the loss of her beautiful son two years ago. Got sober for my kids. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. And then I helped my friend when she fell down. This was probably the number one thing that was done because all these school children were doing this, and that's a big thing. Uh, sharing pencils and opening doors and helping my friend when she fell down. And I included it here because that is probably my favorite because it's actually the most profound, as, awesome, as often is the case with children, is this is not, not what we're all really called to do, is help your friend when they fall down. Mm -hmm. Expand your, your notion of friend, mm -hmm. like if you can get to the place of seeing the world through that lens, it's like, mm -hmm. and we were just so excited to have all these schools involved because that's when you really lay down a lot of these behaviors and these habits is, is with the children. Um, so, the strips of kindness. So then what happened is we made a, a, a big art installation called the Wall of Compassion, where all these boxes interlock to form a wall. This was during during inauguration time and the lead up to it, so there was lots of talk about walls. We wanted to, to try and sort of reclaim that and repurpose it as something that, that unites instead of divides. Um, so we built this wall out of these boxes, and you could pull some of the boxes out and read these blessings, these nice things that people have done. You could add to it. And then, you know, we also had some of the stories going, and then we curated a bunch of the blessings, a bunch of these, like what I just showed you, we made these 10 foot by 10 foot banners. Um, and so people could read some of these amazing things that were done in our community. Um, and then this installation traveled around the city. It was in four different locations. It was at the, the Symphony Performance in Rumeberry Park. It was at the Vision Awards. It was at the Government Center. And it was at the Old Grace Church Building. Um, as part of the Charlotte Art, art Crawl, that time the Art Crawl. And it was incredibly well attended, great reception. Um, these are some stats, since we're supposed to talk about numbers. Um, 2,500 blessing boxes, 20,000 participants, that's an estimate. I think it may be actually even more because of all the school children. Um, and we actually went through every single strip of paper um, to curate them. And there was over 100,000 acts of kindness done in our community over the course of the month. Um, so we, we feel we're really excited about it. Um, so that was sort of last year. So now we're finally getting up to the present moment. What we're all here for um, is our, our project for this year. OK. We've already talked about this a little bit. Sharing stories to shift culture. This is this is where we we see how we, we fit into the Charlotte philanthropy landscape, telling people's stories to get people engaged. Our project for this year is called All Kids Are Our Kids. And the idea is uh, how do we how do we get people in the city to rally around children's issues? Children's issues are something we can all get on board with, no matter what your belief system or political stripe. We all care about children, and given some of the, the, the news of the last couple of years with the, the, the Opportunity Task Force, we realized that we're not doing a very good job of providing opportunity for our children. One in five children in Charlotte live in poverty. There's only a 4% chance they will ever get out of poverty. Um, the, the, the argument that really resonates with me is the, the missing Einstein's argument. It's like, how many a cure for cancer may be at Bruns Academy right mm -hmm. now, and we're going to miss it because mm -hmm. we're not taking care of our children. Mm -hmm. um, so what can we as storytellers do to raise awareness for these issues and encourage engagement? Creating a culture of caring. This is what we see our job being. This is a direct quote from the Opportunity Task Force, and the preamble to all their recommendations for everything that they need to do is without public will, None of this is going to work. And this is one of our core beliefs, that we make the society that we live in. Our desires, our values creates the society. And so we want to help rally public will and get people to a point of where they can say, all kids are our kids, um, to rally people around these issues. How do we do that? It's a four-part process. Energize, empathize, educate, and engage. The four E's 
how to make it easy. Um, they're even in red. So when you go home tonight, you can say, what are they trying to do? Four E's. Energize, empathize, educate, and engage. This is a large scale, super ambitious project that we're trying to do. We're trying to, to, to raise funds and get going with the first two E's right now, energize and empathize, educate and engage comes down the road as we grow. The first E, energize. How do you get people's attention? How do you get people to, you know, get outside of their busy day, get outside of their phone, get outside of their social media account, and realize that there's something going on they need to pay attention to? This is our immersive awareness campaign to get everybody's attention. The first part of which is a collaboration with this thing called the Inside Out Project. The Inside Out Project is started by this French artist, JR, who's a really famous artist who puts faces up all over the place. Um, and he just had an Academy Award nominated documentary called Faces Places. Um, and he has created this organization called Inside Out whereby he will print if you take pictures of faces that is uh, pointing towards a social cause, we will print them for you for a fee, for cost basically, ship them to you, you we paste them up all over your town, and then he promotes it on his global website through his global social media. So our vision is to uh, take 2,000 portraits of children in our community from every corner of our community, um, and then paste them up everywhere in the city. So everywhere you go, you see a face of which one is a symbolic act that Charlotte is engaging with children's issues and on a global scale. People around the world will see that Charlotte is serious about tackling these issues. And it's also a marketing piece. People are saying, what's going on? Why are these faces everywhere? And that drives you to the content and the educational component. So this was our original vision. It's just this inside out piece. We then met with Blair Primus at Ortho Carolina. I don't know if you guys know Blair. Um, but he is the head of marketing and he's the head of the foundation at North Carolina. And he is one of these sort of outside the box thinkers in Charlotte, more visionary with his marketing and the philanthropy. And he's like, it needs to be bigger, it needs to be bigger. <laughs> like, his head exploded. Um, and he says, you know, sides of buses, billboards, let's take over the epicenter, all their digital billboards, all their traditional billboards, put it on the jumbotron at the baseball game super saturated, um, and so we're in discussions with them. That's one of the ways they do philanthropy is to provide in-kind ad buys, basically. They do all these ad buys everywhere. Um, so we're talking to them about them donating to help make this even bigger. The last piece of this that we're working with, Center City Partners, they work with us on the Blessing Box campaign um, to get us at the Vision Awards and with the Symphony, um, and they are doing, putting together the Charlotte Shout Festival, um, and they had asked us to uh, submit a proposal for doing, covering some of these buildings in Uptown as part of this project. Um, so that's another way. So basically, this is the month of May 2019. If we can get this thing going, everywhere you look for the entire month, you're going to see faces of children. Okay. Second E, empathize. So that drives, the energize gets people's attention. This is the girl who hugged me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, um, and so this is the empathize piece. This once you've got their attention, how do you get people to care? And this is where the storytelling comes in, which is the work we've been doing um, through portraiture and through making videos. We, we raise awareness about and connection with different people in our community, basically, and stir people up. Um, the third E, which is going to be coming later, third and fourth E, is once you've got their attention. A bundle this into a curriculum, basically. The video comes with a curriculum that can be done in your, your adult Sunday school, it can be done mm -hmm. at your place of work. We've been talking to um, Matt Owen and Tim Miner at the mm -hmm. Creative Morning mm -hmm. folks about implementing it and what they're doing for the creative community. Um, basically, because we think there's the, the, the journey is get their attention, open their heart, touch their heart, educate them, and then give them a pathway to action which is the fourth the engagement piece. It's like, at the end of this curriculum, it's like, these are the things you can do. And this curriculum is developed with the, the nonprofit people who are experts in the field. So say, the immigrant and refugee nonprofits would say, we don't need volunteers, but we need money, and you need to write your congressperson telling them this, or support this piece of legislation, whatever 
whatever it is for them, they are defining what how best people can be involved in their issues. This is a big, huge, crazy piece. Mm -hmm. We've been we're talking to Sheriff Charlotte about it. We've been talking to um, this guy, Rob Kelly, at Fort Charlotte, because they've developed a, a technology platform that may cover part of this piece. Um, but this isn't really in our wheelhouse. What we really are good at, and what we're trying to do for right now, is this energized piece and the empathized piece. Get people stirred up, get people talking. And the, the, the long-term goal for what we're doing is, is getting this done, building some credibility, building some energy and some momentum. So RNC 2020, we're gonna be in a position to present Charlotte as a place of kindness and compassion because we're apolitical, we're not religious, um, but the idea is, is we're not taking, saying yes, de Democrat, yes, Republican. We're not, we're saying connection, talk, humanity. And so we want to be in a position to do a large scale project of this ilk when the eyes of the world are on Charlotte and there's going to be a whole lot of, of negative energy and a lot of people fighting. And so we want to be in a position to bring this sort of a perspective to that stage. Um, so that's sort of the summary. Energy, empathy, education, and engagement. This is our recipe for how we create a caring community where we care for all children as if they are our own. And this is a test that we did just to see how it would work. We printed some up on our own. These are some children from, uh, what's season six um, Trinity. Um, got some kids together and took pictures and pasted them up. And I think it'll be a really cool thing. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what we're trying to do. Like sort of in summary is is there's there's a lot of like I have to stop reading news regularly just because it's it's unhealthy. Um, and we're we're inundated with, with messages of division. Um, and our goal is to sort of be a drumbeat for a message of connection and empathy and kindness. Um, we wanna sort of combat that and be an antidote to that. Because um, I think there's a lot of mental health issues that are on the rise. And, and I had dinner with a buddy of mine last night who's like, like I'm a decent cinematographer, but he's like a big deal cinematographer, like movies and stuff. And he actually lives in a show, which is kind of crazy. Um, but he's just like, we were talking about it. And he's got all this, stuff, like on the exterior, he's got this dream life, like me. He's got this like unbelievable life, but he's got all this stuff going on. And we've all got it going on, and it's like, it heals when we connect. Mm -hmm. was, and that's what we're trying to do, is get people to, to get outside themselves and connect with each other, and see each other's humanity. And then, to me, the social issues spontaneously trickle down from that. Like, if we are all connecting to each other, and you know, take care of itself. So that's what we're doing, that's what we're trying to do. Questions, comments? <laughs> so what, what are your, if you had to prioritize your needs and, and your, you know, to match it between now and May? Money. Okay. What we've been doing is, for the last three months, we've been ref pitching, refining, yep. um, and a lot of it has been relationship building mm -hmm. because Blessing Box was successful it wasn't big enough to where people were writing us checks because like some people know about it. Right. Um, and so our strategy has been a lot of relationship building. And so we met with the mayor, we've met with Brian Collier mm -hmm. multiple times. Mm -hmm. We did put us in touch with Stephanie Cooper Luder, mm -hmm. um, who we did meet with, and she wants us to um, pitch her board. She wants us to talk to her board. Mm -hmm. You know, we're meeting with Charles Thomas, we've met with some foundations, some individuals who I was met with. Kristen Hill's Bradbury. We're like, yeah. Just I was going to say, every, I, keep, I keep writing down Julie names, Isles. and then I'm like, oh, chick. <laughs> chick. And I'm like, sure, sure. Oh, you met with them. And, and the funny thing about that is when we first started this three years ago, he's like, look, I'm really good with photography and cinematography. I don't want to have a lot of movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this past year has been such a yeah. learning experience. And so we're doing lots <laughs> well, of you're that. Good at it. And like met with D. O'Dell, like meeting with yeah. the people. Yeah. You know, we've got a communities and schools meeting coming up. We yeah. 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 yeah, so we're hitting all those people, but we're we're we've raised 
for the budget for this first piece, the piece that's up here to do this, we've raised about 30% of what we need to do through individuals and through Charlie, and we're applying for an Arts and Science Council grant, um, which people seem to think we're in line for. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, uh, frankly, we're trying to learn the philanthropy landscape sure. as we're going, which is daunting, and we've learned a lot. Um, and just trying to get connected to the, the type of people that are interested in funding this sort of thing, since we're not a direct services organization, um, and we don't, the metrics are all kind of intangible, and um, and so a lot of it has been trying to make our way to individuals or family foundations that would potentially be interested um, in someone who gets in here and talks about love and compassion um, as a, a healing, <laughs> as a way of being sure. like. For all of us, and it's like, because it truly is, it, the idea is it's not like there's all these people over here that need to be fixed. And I think the, the, the idea that, that that suffering is the, the sole domain of people living in poverty is it's ridiculous and offensive. And it's like, and so it's getting beyond some of that to where it's like we all need healing, we all need connection. If you can be the richest person in Charlotte, you miserable, you know, like, or struggling or hurting because your child or, I mean, it's like, and so there's this deeper message going on of how do we choose to be with each other? How do we connect with people? Are we seeing the people in front of us? Um, and that's the deeper thing that's going on, um, which we can't always talk about in, in like pitch meetings, and I don't know why I feel like I can just talk to you guys. <laughs> it's like, unless you ask that, And then what Just we're doing the for this. The, the photography and the printing and the like yes, and circulation the and installation is not included in that. It is. It the is. storytelling is not. The, yeah. the storytelling about specific issues. The way we were originally going to do this is we were going to pick four issues and tell those stories. We were originally going to try and fund the whole thing, which is mm -hmm. you know, a couple million dollars, which is a lot. Um, but the idea was we were going to do four stories, pick four story topics, immigrant, refugee children, social capital, mental health, LGBTQ, and fund it, raise the money, and do that. The way we're doing it now is we're funding the initial piece, and the storytelling piece is an a la carte sponsorship type deal, where it's so say for $10,000, you're a, a corporation or a donor or a family fund um, that, that is aligned with, say, childhood literacy. And so they wouldn't necessarily be interested in funding us to tell a story about immigration, because they're about childhood literacy. So for $10,000, we can go out and make a story about childhood literacy, which speaks to your, the issue that you care about, in the nonprofits that you're already investing in, so that when we do this big, this big awareness campaign, it drives you to the content where this childhood literacy story is going to be mm -hmm. featured. Um, so it gives you a way to participate. We made the story piece more of an a la carte investment, which gives people the room to to participate in setting the agenda rather than us dictating. Mm -hmm. and and it's tangible, because otherwise it's hard to package these in. As I'm sure you're learning about philanthropy uh, and fundraising, there is a, an art and science to yeah. appealing to donors, right? And I think that's because yeah. um, everybody's got an agenda, what they care that's about, right. and that's we right. want to be able to be a mouthpiece that's for right. them. As long as it's not about hate, like we don't discriminate, <laughs> but it's like we're not going to like do a white nationalist yeah. like. Sure. <laughs> and but so it's like, back to your point too about we need to be funded. So and there's just four, a team of four of us right sure. now, and we've all got gifts, but we need. Fundraiser, we need to hire a strategy person, you know, to get better and to grow. We've got to hire people. Um, That's long term growth. <laughs> for the immediate, we yeah. want to do this thing. Right. right. We'll so, and you're talking about hiring for about face. This is one of the many projects, right? Because I mean, this, this yes. would, yeah. not that it doesn't have a life beyond May of 2019, but certainly that is the culmination of this particular sleeve of your, uh, Correct. your work. Because after the Blessing Box campaign, there were two and a half of us working on it. But we got emails and calls from eight different um, cities all over the country mm -hmm. which are saying, how can we do this here? Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a twofold approach. We're trying to grow the organization and we're also, but the core, the focus for right now is getting this off the ground mm -hmm. because I think that leads to the other. 
we have to get enough traction, enough exposure to where the organization becomes sustainable. Like we're not, I don't think we're, unless somebody knows somebody who like wants to give us a bunch of money to do the organizational bit, I think that there's pragmatically, realistically, that we need to do another, we need to grow. Okay. We need to grow upon the Blessing Box campaign, grow this, show what we can do, and, and sort of slowly build you know, the trust and the awareness in the community mm -hmm. uh, to keep doing this work, because we're committed to, you know, this is an on, I mean, we view this sort of change as, you know, 20 year mm -hmm. timeline, like, because I'm a person who's been committed to attempting this in my own life, mm -hmm. like being compassionate and, and seeing all kids, and, like, it's not even just children, it's like, you know, I've studied a lot of Buddhism where it's like, mm -hmm. one of my favorite teachings is the Metta Sutta, which is the Buddha's meditation on loving kindness. And part of that he explicitly talks about you know, the way a mother loves a child, like love all sentient beings with the ferocity of a mother's love for a child, who would lay down her life for her child, you know, like, to me, it's like, if I can get there, like, for every single being that I meet, like, and I'm committed to that, and I've been working on it for a real long time, and I'm terrible at it, and so we view this as, like, this is a life's work. This is a 20-year process. It's not like, we're not going to solve poverty in Charlotte in the next three years through loving kindness, or through anything, probably, um, but it is, we're committed to this, like I said, it's this drumbeat of this message of, like, people, be people, mm -hmm. it's good for you, <laughs> but heal you, to make you feel better, like let's take care of each other. <laughs> yeah, we're that's five the women. We're not. I mean, that's a disability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Not we actually yeah. present because a group came to McCall. This was we did the blessing box with their residency in McCall, and a, a group from Women's Impact yeah. yeah. came through. It was like a McCall thing, though. It's like I had to be the dancing monkey for a McCall. Oh, <laughs> 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 wow.
five years to get into the and have such a positive way. That's why it's going to build up community. Mm -hmm. So thank you for supporting me. We'll mm -hmm. all be thinking of um, mm -hmm. other ideas too. And I've got mm -hmm. one thing where I'll suggest that. There's, there's one more point, but since you brought it up. I just said, Given the communities and schools connection, I wanted to talk about this piece again a little bit. One of the things that we have come to understand is that we need to sort of put our money where our mouth is in terms of social capital. And so this piece, creating this stuff and creating this stuff, we are giving up some control here. <laughs> and basically, you know, I have some experience, I've been around and had some exposure. We want to provide that for other people. So the 2,000 children's photographs, we're gonna assemble a team of 10 photographers, a diverse team of photographers so that they can do the work and see their work up on the side of the building and get some exposure. Likewise here, this is the communities and schools thing, is we're working with Lloyd Visuals who I'm did sure. your communities and schools yeah. videos super talented group of this, uh, three young yeah. brothers who are amazing and and they're new and like this they are like buddy they're babies yeah but they're really talented they're gonna they're gonna i we're meeting with them i'm like you can be fine without us like because they're know, amazing keep, keep, yeah, this is super helping them. This is yeah and so it's like these guys you know we're meeting with them and they understand the vision and they're like we are these kids you know this is how we grew mm -hmm. up um and so there's an authenticity thing, and there's also an opportunity thing where it's like, they can tell these some of these stories way better than I could ever do so. Um, and also it's an opportunity to give them a leg up, you know, by through some of this exposure. So I did want to note that as sort of part of our philosophy is, is first of all, these stories are not, it's not poverty on parade, it's not victim porn, it's not Sally Struthers. That is not what we do. The idea is it's a celebration of people and the potential. It's the most Einstein idea. It's like, look at this beautiful child. Look at this amazing child. How can we make this child's dream come true? It's not about, look at the poor person. It's like, that's not what we're doing. I mean, I want to make that crystal clear that it's really a celebration and an honoring, um, and it's not poverty on the road. Yeah. And I think there's like, I've been doing some research. It's like, because it's also it's like, how do you communicate? I read a fascinating case study. There's this company in DC um, called Frameworks, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And they basically, as a case study that they got, they, they, they help people figure out how to communicate mm -hmm. scientific ideas and charitable ideas. And they're talking about, um, they got hired by Alberta to come up to help them do messaging. Mm -hmm around drug addiction, because there's a massive drug addiction crisis in Alberta. And they studied and they figured out that the way that you need to message to Albertans is it's like, because it's all about resilience, it's all about self-sufficiency. And so it's not pity, you don't do pity, like look at the poor drug people. It's like, all right Albertans, there's a problem that we haven't solved yet. And if we pull together, we can figure out how to do it. And so it's like, what is that for Charlotte? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's speaking to that. It's like, hey, Charlotte, we are 50th out of 50, mm -hmm. and we're better than that, and we're smart, and we're successful, and if we, you know, make it a challenge where it's like, rather than making it a pity, making mm -hmm. it a charity, making it a flanky thing, make it a challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. I work, I've got a week, but I, uh, I work with Brian, and how we're really working on Thing. We've been talking to a long-running conversation with Elizabeth Tosh um, mm -hmm. about their, their MacArthur grant, and because she wants to tell the story, she realizes that telling the stories about some of these mm -hmm. issues around the culture Personally, it's really big on my list too because Tatiana, my friend, suffered from mental health illness and just being around her and being around her Yeah. <laughs>
She's awesome. Are you, are you interested in, like, like this, um, specific endeavors Showing glimpses of where our kids can be, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and those types of endeavors that impact the target, the, the, the population of demographics. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in connecting photographers with those kind of Absolutely. photo opportunities for, for kids rising up. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with Shirley Fulton, Judge Shirley Fulton mm -hmm. at Brown's Academy, and he's also been working on an incredible. Story about a girl that to me, what she's talking about is what America has been. Yeah, I mean, we're open to all anything with children that helps uplift it within our capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a network of photographers and folks, Ginger included. <laughs> I, I, I've met the guy who, who yeah. runs. Yeah, I just met him. I don't know. I'm aware of them, and I, I met once yeah. socially the guy who started it. They're all Charlotte is in October. Apparently, it's already sold out. I think out. it's already, yeah. yeah. And now, so I don't know how the lineup is established, but even if it's one that might be worth you know, trying to attend, yeah. usually you're right in there, even though it's already sold out. So I don't know how you do that. But yeah. I know I put it on my calendar a while ago and then saw mm -hmm. some post that said, Cut it, Charlotte, it's already sold out. So, well, <laughs> well, I think it's on my calendar. Grab a good ticket. I think it'd be amazing if he could do it after yeah. this is successful. Too. Yeah, you're yeah. Right. yeah. Sure, sure. I'm trying to think about away, and an agenda obviously. Agenda is a great is a great mechanism. Mm -hmm. You're obviously getting all the right people mm -hmm. in the meetings. Yeah. You know, the challenge then is how to translate that into their, you know, the broader message. And that. we've got a good distribution network. I mean, Ted Williams at Charlotte Agenda is like anything you want to put out right. ever, it's I will great. do it. We've been That's in right. Charlotte Five. We know Katie Toussaint over there. Yeah. We're talking to WSOC TV has reached out to us. They want to be a media partner. Awesome. 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 About what that would potentially look like. Yeah. We've been in the Observer, we've been in Charlotte Magazine, we've been in South Park Magazine. Yeah. Yeah. See, this just so shows that I, I, I'm just, just a little under a rock. So. No. no, you're not. Yeah. That's that, the that problem. Because you have two children you work full time. <laughs> no, that's true. I was going to say that's true. And I also, you know, don't, don't watch the news um, for the yeah. reasons that you said. So yeah. I just, I mean, I'm in my, you know. It's like, I mean, we're in that weird place where we've had this level of, we've had some level of success, and we've been in all these places, yeah. but yet we can sit in a room and people are like, right. I mean, we meet some people who are like, you're the most people, right. like, right. but that's not the majority, like, right. we're still, we're but sort of out there, but like, not fully. I had two other things, I don't know, now it's time to share, you know, to the end, um, and then would love to talk about potential grant making maybe offline through the foundation. But the two things I thought of, do y'all know about there's some free ad thing at the epicenter that y'all that they yeah. offer for nonprofits? Yeah, yeah, so the biggest the big screen that's on the side of the epicenter is always open to nonprofits and it's free of charge. So oh. in oh. January to kick off our sixtieth anniversary, the foundation was featured, which is yeah. um do you so have I didn't, a person that we can figure we'll it out. Our Evan, media Evan, person would know. Evan, no. And actually, yeah. weirdly, Evan was somehow involved. So oh, anyway, we'll find out and let you know. And Our then you have the other one, yeah. So <laughs> which is, I think it had to do with his prior employer. Ah. So I like somehow we knew. Anyway. And the other thing was, I just bought tickets to Children's Theater for Last Step on Market Street. Have you all yeah. seen this? So it's the uh, um, Children's Theater is doing, and I don't know anything about it. It's, it, it claims and what that it's part of the Kindness Project. What the kindness project is, mm -hmm. it sounds like it's a line. Mm -hmm. 
that the last time on Market Street is a book about mm -hmm. a little boy who have you read that? Yeah, yeah. Who um who rides the bus with his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um anyway, and so they're doing a performance mm -hmm. of Last Summer Market Street mm -hmm. and then and again all I know is that the tickets were more expensive than their normal ones. So I don't know if they're aligning with some kind of corporate yeah, you know, yeah, national yeah. project. So it's called part of the kindness project. So just and it's like three weeks in late October, early November, so I just don't know if there's any alignment there mm -hmm. in terms of, you know. Yeah, okay. yeah I don't know. It's funny it's because now for baby gifts, I'm getting way off track, but yeah. I started giving, I started giving books like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, we just, we've been reading uh, Maddie's Bridge, I don't know if y'all, that was a book that um, is awesome, that yeah. Loads and Fishes gave out at their lunch, and Maddie and Sophia go to school together, and Maddie doesn't have to be in the refrigerator. And like, I mean, my daughter who's four and a half will be like, you know, like Maddie, Maddie doesn't yeah. have any milk. I'm like, you're right. I mean, she, mm -hmm. it's yeah. a very, it's yeah. a really well done book. I actually like it better than last stuff on Market Street. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. what, just what? okay on that after yeah, I bought the book and tickets. But anyway, so I just, um, like finding ways, and, and it speaks to me because I'm square in the middle of this, right, with the age my kids are. <laughs> you know, so it's very top of mind to me to, to grow, to, to grow humans that are, Passionate and caring, and you know, yeah. have perspective, um, and so you know that speaks to me on so many levels. And storytelling is really the only way to do that. With that age group, mm -hmm. so. How old are you? Um, four and a half and one and a half. Okay. Okay. Amazon time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another thought that there might be alignment is On the Table, which is yeah. an initiative out of Knight Foundation um, nationally, but the Foundation for the Carolinas is hosting it um, this year, and it's October the 24th, um, and I'm the point person, so if there's, if there's interest, I can um, certainly sort of talk about how we could really partner. Um, the, this year's topic is the legacy of segregation and its ongoing impact. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, not mm -hmm. exactly aligned, but certainly there's mm -hmm. threads throughout. And I, what makes me really excited um, for us to, you know, potentially partner is that we're really committed to community-led action as a result of these conversations. Mm -hmm. I think last year it was really about the conversation and we let that speak for itself. This year, we really want the conversation to lead to more than just a conversation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we've got a website, we've got a host kit that, you know, potentially we could incorporate in some suggestions for, for action that could drive. So let's talk offline and maybe figure out how to connect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.